let Melanie Giesler be our, she is our speaker for the evening. She's with the Institute of Applied Ecology, which is based in Portland, Oregon. Corvallis. Cor oh, it is in Corvallis. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I've been there. I have a cousin there. And it is a 501c3, with, whose mission is to conserve native species and habitats through restoration, research, and education. And you've been with them for 12? Since the beginning, since 16 years. 16 years. <laughs> now, are you a native of New Mexico? Or you uh, did your... Did I grew your, up in New Mexico, and I left for school. So. Left for school, but you did your <laughs> bachelor's here at, at UNM. Yeah, UNM. Right. Yeah. And then she kind of went where there's... We get hydrated, the Pacific Northwest yeah. <laughs> and British she Columbia. Was like, and, be back. <laughs> and she's back in New Mexico to dry out. And uh, <laughs> she's going to tell us about the work. Um, so she's, she's now the head of the Southwest branch of this uh, Institute of Applied Ecology. So welcome, Melanie. Well, thank you. Yeah, and I just wanted to let you know that the Southwest program just opened up in May of 2015, and we're in Santa Fe. So come see us sometime. So I just thought I'd take a couple minutes to tell you about um, who we are. Um, the Southwest program staff, um, we have a, a conservation planner, um, and actually Cameron uh, lived here in Taos for many years and worked as a farmer. Um, and then we have Yvonne Hickerson, and she is an ecologist. She's helping us with our native plant curriculum. And uh, this year we had three interns who did our native seed collection. Um, and uh, two of them have gone back to school and the other one has, is still working with us part time. And uh, I wanted to tell you about some interesting news if you haven't already heard that the Native Plant Society is uh, looking to hire an outreach coordinator to help promote the Native Plant Society and increase membership. And um, the, the Institute for Applied Ecology is going to potentially host that person through our office. So uh, we're really excited about that and this potential partnership. And uh, we're guided by a technical advisory board because we want to make sure we're doing the kinds of conservation that's truly needed here in New Mexico. And that's composed of Steve Carey, who's the butterfly guy in the state. He's, you know, he's our entomologist. And uh, Ann Bradley, who has expertise in fire ecology. Molly Walton, who is the director uh, for the land and water program for Quivira. And then you probably heard or met Bob Savinsky before. He's the former state botanist. I haven't been able to get Bob up here to speak. Oh, you should get Bob. But Steve's been here twice. Oh, great. First about butterflies and then about cats. <laughs> Gardening for cats. Yeah, he's a, he's a good advocate. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about our current programs. Um, and we're working in all three areas, restoration, research, and education. So um, in, in restoration, we have a project to do wetland restoration and pollinator habitat restoration. And we have a new proposal that we're putting in this week to restore the Leonor Curtin wetland, which is just south of Santa Fe. And the Native Plant Society is partnering with us on this proposal, uh, the Native Plant Society of Santa Fe. Um, for restoration purposes, we're also developing native seed. And I'm gonna talk a, a lot more about that in a little bit. Uh, as for research and monitoring, uh, we're doing some work with rare plants, especially cactus up in the Farmington area, and working with some entomology experts. We're doing uh, native bee surveys and um, also pollinator or um, butterfly surveys. And um, there's, we're also supporting the rare plant conservation strategy. I don't know if you know about this, but. Um, it's a, a new effort to help improve protection for rare plants in the state. Currently, um, rare plants don't have any state level protection, and so um, this is an effort being led by Daniela Roth with um, the State Forestry Program. And last but not least, education. We have a native plant curriculum. So what I'm going to be talking about tonight are some exciting new initiatives for native plants in New Mexico. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the native plant curriculum um, and then this um, new program called the Southwest Seed Partnership that I'm really excited to tell you about and then some efforts that we're doing towards monarch and pollinator conservation. And so really this talk is like three little talks and I'll, I'll make a uh, opportunity for a break in between so that in case you have questions before I move on to the next topic. So let's start with the native plant curriculum. Um, so w this curriculum is funded by the Bureau of Land Management and also by the Native Plant Society. Um, 
the Native Plant Society is uh, paying for the printing of the curriculum. And so this curriculum is designed for high school students and, um, and it's due to come out in December of 2016, so just a few months from now. This, this curriculum is based on a model um, that we used in Oregon. I have a copy of it here. Okay. This is the Oregon curriculum, and it was so well received that um, they let us do it in five other states. And so New Mexico is one of those states, and um, we're really excited about it. We've actually feel like we've made some improvements to it for New Mexico. Um, and also, if you're interested, I have um, some sample sections from the curriculum um, that includes a botanical crossword puzzle. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> we can so work you can um, get a copy of that. And, uh, so uh, the kinds of things that we're covering in this curriculum are, you know, everything from basic botany to um, ecoregions of New Mexico and why they're, uh, it's important to understand your ecoregions, ecology of native plants, understanding how invasive species can affect native plant communities, um, ethnobotany, of course rare plants are important to talk about, restoration, and then, you know, what's in store for native plants in the future. So a, a, a nice discussion of climate change. And so, you know, we feel like um, these lessons need to have some basic guiding principles that include um, a, a sense of place for the students, also providing um, plenty of lessons that have hands-on opportunities and getting outdoors, lots of exercises that take kids outside. Um, we're trying to merge it with other disciplines such as English and math and art, um, and then you know, also providing opportunities for um, kids to do projects in the community, like uh, habitat restoration projects as one of the lessons. And then, of course, we want to meet the education standards. So uh, the next steps for this uh, curriculum, like I said, it's coming out pretty soon. And as soon as that printing happens, we want to get it into the hands of teachers. And, um, and so, then they're going to need to know how to use it. It's, it's pretty straightforward, but a lot of teachers have requested a training. And so we do have a f a funding to put on a webinar for teachers, um, but we're thinking it might also be helpful to have a workshop. But I was thinking it might be even more helpful if we might offer a program to potential interested volunteers who could then go into the classrooms and teach the teachers. And, and I would love to hear from any of you if, if you might be interested in being a part of something like that because that would really help us reach a whole lot more people. So that's, that's section part one um, on the curriculum. And I just wanted to make sure to share that with you since um, Native Plant Society is a funder. Um, when is this webinar? Is it scheduled? Uh, it's not scheduled yet. It'll probably be in the spring. Spring, yeah. But what I did want to know is, is um, I know that teachers have so many scheduled uh, required curriculum mm. points that they have to cover. Are you running into any um, resistance based on that, not based on the merits of this, but rather when do they have the time to get it in and do it? So far, we haven't run into any resistance. We've been mostly talking to the teachers who are already interested in environmental education, and they've all been very excited about it. Uh, and, um, and the other piece of it is because it's interdisciplinary and it meets the core standards, if they, they could use it as a substitution for those subjects. Great. Yes? My daughter actually attends South Academy, and I'm on the board board. So, um, this would be something that would be really great for their STEM courses, which are extracurricular activities. Oh, great. Good. And they have pretty good funding for it. Oh. So it's something we can talk about. Time. Great. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. That's great feedback. All right. Yes. Moving on. So next, I'd like to talk with you about our Native Seed Initiative, and I know that's going to be um, an important subject for Taos in the future. Jan was telling me that um, that's going to be the focus of the next state conference, so that's really exciting. And, um, and our Southwest Seed Partnership. So we know that we have some really beautiful and diverse landscapes here in New Mexico. And, but maybe you didn't know that uh, New Mexico is ranked fourth uh, in the country for biological diversity. So that's quite a, a nice honor. It's probably because of all the diverse habitats that we have. 
unfortunately. Um, on the other hand, we also have uh, extensive areas that lack biodiversity and, and plants, frankly. And here's another statistic for you. We're ranked third highest um, for bare ground. Uh, and I don't, that comes from the NRCS and that they may be measuring more agricultural uh, figures than all the, the wildfires, but that's still pretty high. And so with all this bare ground, um, we, have, we have wildfire mining that causes more bare ground, road construction, certainly over grazing, and erosion can cause more bare ground once that soil erodes away. And even our own restoration activities create a lot of bare ground. And we'd like to think that, you know, there's a seed bank and it's going to, the plants are just going to regenerate naturally from the seed bank. And that does happen some of the time, especially in situations where there's a low intensity burn. Um, or there might be a hydrological connection with uh, a native community that, uh, that's near our site. But we're seeing in a lot of the cases that the seed bank has been lost. It's either been washed away, buried, um, grazed to the point of being exhausted. Uh, it can be suppressed by invasive species, burned up, and inadvertently sprayed when we're doing restoration. So these are some really large scale issues and we're not gonna um, meet the needs by just growing nursery stock materials. And so what we really need is large quantities of native seed. And not just any native seed, we wanna make sure that that seed is going to be uh, successful on these restoration sites. And so we want the highest quality um, and that means locally sourced and genetically diverse. So why locally source seed? Studies have shown that, we're going, that we get better germination uh, when we're using seed that is adapted to the site where it's being planted. And also we know that genetic diversity can improve restoration success and, um, and long-term survival because it improves the adaptive capability of those plants over time and in the events of climate change and things like that. So um, in terms of sources of native seed, for New Mexico and Arizona, we don't have very many sources of native seed. There's only one native producer, in the uh, seed producer in the entire state uh, in Clovis, New Mexico. And the seed that they have is not locally adapted. It's usually sourced from outside the region and doesn't have the genetic diversity that we're after. And our one seed producer only produces grass seed. So I, as Jan mentioned, I come from the Willamette Valley of Oregon, and um, we were in this, we had the same problem about 15 or 20 years ago where our growers were doing a great job with native grasses, and we get restoration sites that look like this, monocultures of native grasses. And that's great, it's all native, but do you see anything wrong with this site? What's missing? everything else. We don't have the diversity. So we really do need forbs in our restoration sites. The forbs feed the insects and the insects feed the birds and so on up the food chain. That's a great picture. Isn't that fun? With a different species of pollinator on each. <laughs> So uh, the way that we solved this problem in the Willamette Valley is we created a partnership uh, and we had 30 partners, restoration people, seed producers, and um, we all got together and we pooled our resources and, um, to, and we got to do collection, production, and the funding even paid for coordination. And so now today we have 50 species in, in production. So that's a really exciting, a lot of Forbes, mostly Forbes. And now we're in the process of doing a similar program here in New Mexico, actually for New Mexico and Arizona. Um, so the goal of this new partnership, the Southwest Seed Partnership, is to improve the supply and diversity of eco ecologically appropriate native seed. And our funders are the Forest Service and also the BLM. 
So you can see that um, you know there's a great amount of interest in this program. It's it's actually really starting to snowball because the need is just so great. And so we've got partners on a national level, regional level, and some New Mexico partners. Even New Mexico DOT has come forward and said we want to we want to see if we can help support this program. So the goals obviously are to improve the supply of native seed, but we want to make sure that we're growing the right species for the right sites, um, getting a diversity, greater diversity of species available, making sure that the genetics are appropriate, and then of course we would like to make that affordable. So I mentioned the Willamette Valley partnership model. Uh, there's actually a lot of other models out there uh, that we can use um, while we're developing this program. So it's been done before, so we can do it again. So what I'm observing right now is somewhat of a native seed renaissance. And uh, you know, there's been a lot more um, interest and acceptance in um, the idea of developing native plant materials. Uh, in 2015, um, there, uh, the, National, or sorry, the Department of the Interior released the National Native Seed Strategy. Have any of you heard of that before? Okay, some people are nodding their heads. Uh, I got, I have a couple copies here if you're interested in looking at that closer. But um, the motto for the national strategy is the right seed for the right place at the right time. And so we're tying our goals to the national strategy. So in terms of um, how we're going about it, uh, I'm just gonna list some of the steps that we're doing to um, for this program. So the first step is to figure out what species do we want to collect and grow? That's a simple step, but it's actually much harder than you think because a lot of people have different opinions about what species uh, we need to be collecting and growing. Most people are really interested in the, the workhorse species, those species that are widespread, that do well on, a sturb, on disturbed sites and that can be easily collected and propagated. And so that's gonna be a lot of our grasses. But we see this as a, a great opportunity to grow native forbs. And um, so here's orange globe mallow. That's a, a good example of a forb that has many wonderful attributes that we're um, interested in. It, it is widespread, so it's like a matrix species. And it's, it is easy to grow and produce, and it's got it's used by native bees, ground nesting bees, um, and it's important forage for antelope, and it's got cultural uses. And so when we're thinking about these plants, um, we're targeting early and late successional species to um, make sure that we're getting the early establishers you know, um, able to establish on the site. And we're definitely interested in milkweed. Um, as many of you know, milkweed is the larval host plant for the monarch butterfly, and um, it has many other attributes, including its, um, it att attracts a diversity of beneficial insects. Those are all different species of? These are all different milkweed. species of milkweed with insect, different species of insects on them. And you know they'll use the flowers. They'll use um, you know they'll, some beneficial insects are eating the aphids off the <laughs> the milkweed, so they're they're not just attracted to the flower. Uh, we're interested in nitrogen fixers, things in the legume family. And so when we're um, thinking about. Uh, which species we're going to develop, um, we have to think about which ecoregions um, have the greatest need for seed. And so we look at those sites that where there's a lot of projects and a lot of need, and that those are the ecoregions that we target first. And we're not just limited to New Mexico because ecoregions cross state boundaries. So the second step in this process is to collect the seed. And that's what we've been doing. Um, in 2016, uh, this was our collection area, and that included three ecoregions, the Arizona-New Mexico Plateau, the Southern Rockies, and the Arizona-New Mexico Mountains. And you'll see a little blank spot. This little blank spot up here, uh, we just haven't gotten permission yet. Uh, that's Navajo Nation uh, land, but that's within those ecoregions.
so it was really neat. We had about nine, a team, a crew of nine people, um, and the reason why we were able to do that is we partnered with some other um, agencies and organizations, and um, so that we had a really big collection effort this year. And so the seed is going to be used for both production, but also some of the seed is going to be put in safe storage for, for long-term uh, storage. And this year, it's actually that number is higher now. We've collected over 70, uh, 70 uh, accessions and from multiple populations so we can get that genetic diversity. So uh, here are some of the targets for the Arizona-New Mexico Plateau. Um, I would be very interested in having, if you know what these are, um, having you call out the names of these plants. Mm -hmm. Let's see, I'll point to them and see if you can, a little test here. Uh, that one's hard to see, I might have to help you. You can tell it's a grass, but which one do you think it is? Yep, yeah, that's right. How about that guy? A Rocky Mountain bee plant. Yep, that one? Blue grandma. Yep, you guys are good. How about that? Uh-huh. And this one might be a little harder. It's not looking as characteristic. What's that? Is it the horsetail? Yes, it's horsetail milkweed. And this one? Mallow, and this one's kind of hard to see, but it's... Winter fat. Yeah, wait, good. Excellent. You, I have one more test for you here. <laughs> for the Arizona-New Mexico Plateau, do you know what that one is? Yep. Yeah. What about that? Mountain Yeah, you guys are really good. This is, um, this is a grass, it's hard to tell. That's a blue stem. Yep, the little blue stem. This one? A vetch. It's a lotus. Um, this is um, uh, uh, Wright's deer, uh, or, well, sorry, Wright's deer vetch. So, yeah, you're right. It's the common name is vetch. And um, what's that? Yep. Excellent job. So I mentioned that we want to make sure the seed is locally adapted, but that's not always easy to figure out. So, um, so the, the next step is to figure out um, how far the seed can be safely moved and still be locally adapted. And so we are using ecoregions as a starting place for guiding seed movement. And the reason for that is because ecoregions have similar climate, soils, elevation, and vegetation. And these are the things that are important to plants. And after that, we, we're, we have all these tools available to us to further refine seed zones and make sure we're, um, we're using the right seed zones. So now we've got our seed in hand. We know how far it can move. So the next step is then to grow it, grow it at a farm. And so um, producers are a part of our Southwest Seed Partnership. And we are in the process of assessing their capacity and their interest and their experience in growing native plants. And we're very happy and lucky that we do have some funding to start production already. Um, and so we've got several fields that we have funding for. We haven't started production yet. We're still getting the seed. But then comes that little problem where, did, I remember I mentioned we only have one seed producer in the entire state of New Mexico, um, commercial producer. Uh, so, you know, we definitely will be working with commercial producers and we'll probably be working with most of these um, that are listed here, but that's not going to uh, fill all our needs. So we're going to be looking to smaller scale operations to do smaller scale production and so we're looking at growing seed with tribal nurseries. Santa Ana, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Pueblo of Santa Ana, they have a native plant nursery already and they are they have quite a bit of capacity and they do excellent work. Um, the Pueblo Tasuki has um, capacity and equipment to produce native seed fields and then we could work with local small farmers too. Back in Oregon, um, we are uh, working with prisons to grow native plant materials. In fact, we're doing that over four states. The prisoners, are, their adults in custody are um, growing uh, sagebrush, sagebrush for sage grouse, also some, some rare plants and um, milkweed. So I was just gonna say, we might be able to do that here too, uh, eventually. 
And so, you know, throughout this whole program, it's really important that we stay, you know, coordinated with all of the stakeholders. And so um, we are having a stakeholder meeting this winter to get everybody's input to how this partnership should move forward. And something that I um, like to share with the restoration community is just a, a reality check that it takes a while to go from collection through production to getting your harvest and then ultimately having that seed ready to put on a restoration site. So it could take as many as five years before that seed is ready. Um, and so that's just a, a good thing to keep in mind so that people are planning ahead. So this might be a little frustrating for some because you know we do have these vast areas where there's so much bare ground. How, how on earth are we gonna cover all this territory with that kind of timeline? Well, there are things we could be doing in the meantime while that seed is coming on. Um, one of the things we could do is use the island approach, um, plant small patches and arrange them in kind of a corridor so that they are still providing uh, corridors for wildlife. And then those islands can then be vectors for seed dispersal. So this is um, our progress for the first year. Uh, we've made quite a bit of progress. We've, we've got some target lists. They're still being looked at, but we've got some good ideas of uh, what species we want to collect and grow. We've found producers. Uh, we've had a meeting, and we're going to have another one. Um, we're collecting lots of seed over, um, you know, over a wide area. Uh, we've got some funding for moving forward with production, and we might actually have some seed ready for harvest by 2018. So this is all really interesting and great, but what, what might it mean to you? Um, well, for one thing, uh, native seed will be available to restore natural areas where you like to recreate and enjoy native plants. Uh, this is actually a picture that um, from just a few weeks ago. I went on a, a field trip with the Albuquerque chapter of the Native Plant Society. I was very impressed. We did technical rock climbing on this trip. I couldn't believe it, but it was a lot of fun. But, you know, we also looked at native plants, too. Um, and uh, also, you know, this is going to, this effort is going to help us understand a lot more about how to grow these plants and, um, you know, what, what is required of them when we put them in restoration sites. Um, and then local nurseries could have better resources to offer a greater variety of native species for sale. And, and then ultimately, you know, public awareness of native plants will be improved through us going around, talking to landowners, asking for permission to collect on their land, things like that. So are there any questions? That's the second part of this discussion. I have lots of questions. I don't know where to start. <laughs> <laughs> um, I went to a workshop at Plants of the Southwest a couple weeks ago, making seed balls. Oh yeah. Using clay. Mm -hmm. um, it's a guy from Texas. Well, he used to live in Tasuke, and he lives in Texas now. And you can do it by hand, or there's a tumbler. It's just a barrel that tumbles, and you use terracotta clay. Um, actually, this, he buys it from the places that make terracotta pots, because I guess it's got a, a good mineral content, and then compost, and then seeds, grass seeds, forbs, whatever. And this, these apparently, when it's been tried, as opposed to aerial spraying of seeds for restoration, these seed balls, because they've got the nutrients in them, mm -hmm. and the compost provides the mycorrhizal mm -hmm. uh, cofactor, mm -hmm. that, that so many things need, that they have a much greater success rate. Now, this may be anecdotal, but a better success rate from seed balls. I mean, seed balls are just hard as rock. I mean, it's dry, dried clay. Mm -hmm. But once the rain comes, mm -hmm. then they melt, break down, and then they've got the little nutrients they need to get started. Yeah. Is that a possible consideration on dispersal down the line? Sure, yeah, and um, we've used seed balls before. I first used it um, when I was in Austin, Texas. They do a lot of seed balls down there. They like to mix rhizobium in with the lupin seed, and, and it's, just a, it's, 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 a, it's also a fun way to engage 
people and doing, you know, native seeding. Um, but when I've tried to use it in more of a restoration setting, I've discovered that I get more of a chia pet situation where, like, you have a ball and then, like, everything's coming out of that ball all congested into that little space. And so, um, you know, I think that the things work themselves out, but that, that was something that I, I noticed when I tried to do it in a larger scale setting. When I had first seen seed balls, they were probably an inch, inch and a half diameter. They were really like big truffles. Mm -hmm. and, but this guy said half an inch. He was aiming to get half an inch balls, which is then you wouldn't have so much of that chia pet. <laughs> More balls. More small balls over an area would be better than the big ones, yeah. All right, okay. Any other questions? This is probably, everybody else in the room probably knows it, but what are the three states that are ahead of us in diversity? <laughs> well, I didn't research that, but I'm assuming Hawaii, Arizona, and Texas is what I'm guessing, but don't quote me on that. <laughs> Any other questions for now? Move on. So now um, I'd like to talk with you about some monarch and pollinator conservation initi initiatives that we're working on. So um, President Obama um, uh, signed a memorandum for pollinators and when that happened, um, a lot of good things happened for monarch and pollinators. One of the things was that it led to um, a pollinator conservation strategy um, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Monarch Recovery Fund in 2015. Uh, the only problem with that recovery fund is this is the geographic area that it targeted and there's a few little scattered places here in the Pacific, in the north, in the, in the west coast. But look at right here in the middle, nothing. So um, it's being under prioritized. So um, working with some partners, we are trying to get New Mexico on the Monarch map. And um, so one of the reasons why um, we might not be prioritized for funding is there this is probably an impression that we don't have Monarch butterflies in New Mexico. Um, this is a place where um, private citizens can put their sightings for Monarchs on uh, the Journey North website and then it, um, and then everybody can see where all the Monarchs are. Well, I think that we must not have been very active at this in 2014 because I know we have more than two monarchs in New Mexico. <laughs> so this year we started getting serious about it and actually most of these points are from Steve Carey but we, me and my husband have added a few. Um, anyway, so this is a much better look at what, how many, you know, what New Mexico looks like in terms of monarchs and I think it's going to make a better impression as we continue to do this work and, and Steve Carey and I are interested in getting help from anyone who sees monarchs. Simple process, you go to this website and you say, you just write type in that you saw a monarch. Um, and so if you're interested in doing this, the best time to see monarch butterfly is in um, mid-September. That's when they're um, doing their breeding here. So we're also um, looking deeper and trying to learn as much as we possibly can about monarch and milkweed, because milkweed is the host plant. And working with all these partners here. So. Um, so milkweed is a key habitat element. Uh, the female butterfly oviposits an egg on the leaf of, mon of uh, milkweed, and there's the little tiny egg, and that um, hatches out, and you get a, a very brightly colored caterpillar that eats the leaves and uh, forms a chrysalis. So you can see it's an important part of the life cycle of monarch butterfly. So we're very fortunate here in New Mexico. We have over 30 species of milkweed, and um, and there is um, most of these are used by the monarch butterfly. Uh, the few that may not be used by them, that it's possible that they are used. It's just that we don't see them using them because those are more rare milkweeds. So we've been learning a lot about. Um, milkweed toxicity. Um, we know that uh, the horsetail milkweed is one of the most uh, toxic of the milkweeds. However, this is a horse pasture and it's 
it's practically a monoculture of horsetail milkweed because the horses know better and they eat around it. So why does monarch like it? <clears throat> Monarch um, actually intentionally wants to eat poison milkweed because it helps um, monarch butterfly escape from predation, as well as several mimics of monarch, too. <laughs> so um, we're also trying to learn uh, where milkweed occurs in New Mexico, where the different species occur. Um, Jan earlier asked me about the distribution for broadleaf milkweed, and you can see it's it's very widespread, just a few counties where it hasn't been documented. Subverticillata, is, uh, which is the horsetail milkweed, is in every county of New Mexico. And you have a little better idea of which ones are the rare ones here, too. So this helps us know where we can go to collect seed of milkweed and also where um, which species go where. Like, so we wouldn't want to plant Ruthii down here in the boot heel. And are all the species potential hosts for monarchs? Uh, I've always yeah. tended to think it was just um, Escapia speciosa, the, the showing. Oh, so if I, I'll just go back a couple slides here. Um, so I went a little fast. So these are milkweeds where uh, okay. it has been documented that monarch has used, has, is, was seen using the plant, laying eggs on the plant. The other ones are potential host plants, but we just don't know because they're more rare. So here's a couple of pretty pictures of common milkweeds of New Mexico. Um, there's the showy, and this is horsetail, and the monarch uses the nectar and also lays its eggs on showy or on horsetail and others. There's the broadleaf, dwarf, and antelope horns. So those are some of the more common milkweeds. Now, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir, but um, we don't want to be planting um, non-native and cultivars of um, milkweeds, especially um, please avoid planting tropical milkweed. And why are these species detrimental? Well, um, I don't know a lot about OE, but it's it's a protozoa that is um, that makes uh, it's a disease that monarchs can get, and because the um, tropical milkweed it ha keeps its winter foliage, uh, that keeps the monarchs around longer, and it helps that disease spread. So that's one very good reason not to plant tropical milkweed. Um, and then in terms of cultivars. Um, I would just like you to think about roses, and um, I don't know, you know, there was a time when all roses smelled really good, and then we did all these, this selective breeding to get really pretty flowers, and many roses lost that wonderful smell. Well, that's a similar thing can happen when we make cultivars of a species that's important to a, a species like monarch. Um, it can lose the very chemicals that that, that uh, organism needs. So in terms of um, habitat requirements for milkweed, they're all over the board. There's some very, very wet loving milkweeds such as swamp milkweed, um, and then broadleaf milkweed would be considered more of an upland species, and then I mentioned subverticillata is not very picky. It, you'll see it everywhere, even on the roadsides of uh, you know, Santa Fe and Taos. Um, we've been trying to um, learn as much as we can about growing all these different species of milkweed, um, and the uh, Pueblo of Santa Ana has actually been doing a tremendous job of that, and so if you do have questions about it, I suggest you talk to them. I have a little bit of information, um, but you know, trying to determine which, which milkweeds do well from rhizomes, such as the speciosa. Um, which pests do we care about? Turns out we don't care that much about aphids because um, it doesn't harm the plant. They, and um, which ones are tough to grow? Uh, turns out that um, the uh, antelope horns milkweed is actually kind of hard to grow. And then we're also learning that uh, how to keep milkweed happy at project sites. Uh, we were at Bosque del Apache recently, and they had a project where they're restoring habitat for meadow jumping mouse. And um, lo and behold, the 
the actual maintenance that they were doing for meadow jumping mouse was very beneficial to milkweed and monarch too. And so they have very large stands of horsetail milkweed. And so the protocol that they were using is um, they would mow the milkweed in spring and fall, late fall, so they didn't harm the monarch. And then they would overbank their ditch and so it would get some inundation in the spring. And we're learning who is the best pollinator of milkweed, and it's not the monarch butterfly. In fact, butterflies are not very good pollinators of, of milkweeds because the ha milkweeds have very big, uh, heavy sacks of pollen. Uh, bumblebees are big insects and that are um, the best pollinators, and so you need bumblebees to get good reproduction in milkweed. And so this is a, a great reminder not to get too focused on a single species. And uh, we're learning how to establish milkweed in the Southwest um, by doing some restoration experiments. Uh, we did this project with Quivira that I'm gonna tell you about. So we, um, we, did, we did this comparison of planting milkweed and media luna structures, which are um, structures that um, help trap water and distribute water, and um, then we planted milkweed in three control plots, and we did exactly the same uh, treatments for both. And so, you know, we, um, we raked and seeded, put a little bit of mulch down, built the structures, and then interplanted milkweed in between the rocks, and then watered. And so we have yet to d find out, uh, it's just recently that we did this, but um, we have noticed that there's been some herbivory on the plants, and th but they're still, they're doing great after two months, so, or a month, I should say. So they are doing well both in both uh, the media lunas and in the control plots. Um, in terms of when to plant milkweed, when I first moved back to New Mexico, um, <clears throat> I was uh, asking people when they typically did their plantings and they said, well, we try to time it to the monsoons, which is usually around June or July. Well, if you look at this uh, precipitation map for 2008, um, you know, it shows that, you know, there was monsoons and, you know, the, the peak monsoon was, you know, August, September, and this year, it was even later than that, wasn't it? So it's, it seems like um, we're, I think people are gonna start changing, um, shifting their planting time because it seems like our monsoons might be uh, shifting around. We can't really count on the, the summer moisture. And um, it's, we wanna know how many milkweed are um, needed for, uh, to maintain a breeding population of monarch. And you know, you can get monarch to come to your garden and lay eggs if you have one or two plants. But if you want a, a population to stick around and stay for a while, you're gonna need more plants than that, probably you know, 20 to 100 plants depending on the species. Um, and, you know, we, I've been working with Steve Carey, we've been going around doing some tagging efforts, and this tagging is helping us learn more about where Monarch goes in New Mexico and what does it need. At, um, it needs at trees for afternoon shade and night roosts and wind protection, and here we have Monarch roosting in uh, Lovington, New Mexico. But milkweed needs sun, so what we're really after is more of a savanna kind of thing, because milkweed won't grow in um, full shade. <clears throat> and we're starting to learn which uh, nectar the monarch likes the best. Um, and in the fall, we saw lots and lots of monarchs on um, <clears throat> the uh, annual sunflower, which is everywhere in the state. <clears throat> and, um, and after that was finishing up, on comes the purple aster. But it's been known to, um, the, all these are good nectar sources. <clears throat> And um, you know, trying to learn about the phenology of these different um, plants because pollinators need a diversity of nectar species that bloom throughout their, their season of flight. And that helps to maintain them. <clears throat> and we're also, we also learned that monarchs are indeed using the Rio Grande uh, as a corridor for um, for breeding and migration, so that's really um, a fun discovery. <clears throat>
So the next steps for monarch conservation are for, we want to get monarch on the map. And so we're going to keep tagging and doing research. Um, <clears throat> we really want to try to secure some funding so that we can do some monarch conservation projects, habitat restoration here in New Mexico. And then um, we're going to be doing some strategic planning this winter with some different restoration partners to see you know, what the priorities are going to be for that species. So um, this is kind of my summary slide, but also an opportunity for um, us to talk about ways that the Native Plant Society and all of you can help if you're interested. One way that you can help is you can participate in our partnership by being the eyes on the ground. And I know all of you go out to field trips and maybe you spy a really good population of a species that we're interested in collecting and you could let us know. Um, or maybe you'd like to volunteer someday to help us do some sea collection or cleaning. Um, if you have a property that has native species, you might consider um, letting us come collect some seed on your property or, or track monarchs if you've got monarchs there. Um, consider um, reporting monarch sightings uh, next year when they're back. And then um, I mentioned the native plant curriculum earlier. You might be interested in becoming uh, somebody who helps us train teachers in uh, delivering that curriculum. So um, I want to say that I've been you know, very um, grateful to the conservation community here. I feel like uh, you know, Native Plant Society, Cactus Rescue Project, all, there's some great, wonderful grassroots uh, efforts going on everywhere. And um, I'm really glad for that. And I want to thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Is the cactus rescue in Santa Fe? Yes. Yeah. So, are there any um, questions um, now that I've, I didn't give a really opportunity to talk about Monarch yet. Uh, are there any questions about the Monarch project? Um, I just had a question. I have, um, I live on the, the uh, Santa Fe Trail Pinon Forest right near here on a uh, southwest facing slope so it's very dry and difficult uh, but I would love to be, figure out how to establish the milkweed mm -hmm. so that I could do my part to help out. I know milkweed will grow up there but there isn't any on my property at the mm -hmm. moment and I don't really know how to get it started. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you might try what we were experimenting with is putting in some you know um, water harvesting structures that can, you know, if you're on a slope that will help, you know, keep that water there um, and planting a species that's not too picky, such as the horsetail milkweed that it, I'm, I was amazed. We planted it in the Chihuahuan Desert and we watered it once. I came back, you know, two weeks later and it was still doing just fine. And that was, you know, in September, early September. So um, it's a pretty tough one. So you might consider p picking a species like that and also giving it a little water help. Does that sound reasonable? I, you know, the things that are available, you can find showy milkweed available, but that likes a lot wetter conditions than horsetail. Yes? Well, I think it's related to what you were just talking uh -huh. about. Uh, did, you did the Medea Limnus with Kigera. Yes. Um, where did you put those, the ones, the slide you showed? Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention, that was at Red Canyon Ranch. Oh, uh, down near Socorro. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do you work with Puyer sometimes? Mm -hmm. Not very often. Oh, I've helped them a little bit yeah. on some plants or leaves. Where did that media luna technique uh, come from? There's a fellow um, named Bill Zedike who, um, who, oh, sorry. Um, Bill Z. Dyke um, is somebody who's been doing a lot of this kind of work and who has really been um, uh, promoting and sharing these kind of techniques. I think it, you know, some of these techniques go way back um, to, you know, I think um, some of the Pueblos might have used them. She's shaking her head. She probably knows a lot more about it than I do. <laughs> is, is it a, yeah, and he has a new <coughs> compilation of some older publications called Let the Water Do the Work. Yeah. And it's a good collection of, some are from Zuni and some are way back. Okay. Yeah. Way back, like on a Yeah.
and they use waffle gardens and they have pollinator spaces. Well, I think one of the neat things about it was it's and nobody's ever tried to plant within media luna structures before it's kind of a it was a new approach and so we were excited to see that so far it's working and so how are those made just really? putting rocks on the ground or? really that? that's what molly walton said so <laughs> she said this oh. is first time ever is what she said so well, Penasco, and okay he carries pueblo and then They've been planting within. They've been doing that a long time. <laughs> yeah, but with pollinator species or more agricultural crops. Mm -hmm. There used to be. I mean, I can't. I can't speak specifically to it, but there used to be field tours through like the traditional Native American farming association mm -hmm. that were open to the public, and they did one at, at Peekeries, and there's some other examples. So. Mm. Yeah. Well, thanks for that. I, I don't have. All the data on the yeah, media list. So. It's probably more of the land, you know. Did you say? And so, how do, how do you make one of these? Oh, okay. Well, um, so um, the first thing you do is you create um, kind of a, a channel. Um, and the first thing, there's an expert who actually knows how to site out the, um, where these actually need to go to distribute the water in the proper way. And then um, you kind of uh, create a little channel and you put the largest rocks um, in that channel. This is the first time I've ever built one, so I am not an expert, um, but I helped. <laughs> and so we put the larger rocks in that, and then you just, it, it, as close as possible, interfit um, smaller rocks going back and did it for about, you know, three or four feet. But I think the key is to put it in the right place, and, and that requires somebody who's had years of experience. I'm sure there's a YouTube video. Yeah, because <laughs> it's it, the Pickery's Pueblo. Uh, his last name is Naylor. He used to Gerald. Yeah, yeah. He even gave a talk at the Native Plant Society yeah. a long time ago on how to um, create these. Mm -hmm. And he's done a lot of research on locating uh, ancient sites, ancient agricultural sites, and he's identified them by these little structures that mm -hmm. still exist. So uh, there is at least one local, you know, expert. Yeah. In yeah. This. And that book, Let the Water Do the Work. Um, it, maybe it would be a way to get you a copy of that, or maybe it's available online so you can try it at your property. Yeah. yeah. It is, and I actually was going to ask you, Melanie, are you going to be involved in a conference? Isn't that coming up yes. shortly? Yes. I'm going to be talking about the Native Seed Program. Yeah, that's what I wondered. If they might even have more information there mm -hmm. if you're really interested. In Which conference is that? Quivira, yeah. Oh. Conference, yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, so I do, like I said, I've got um, some botanical crossword puzzles up here if you want to look. Um, and um, the copy of the curriculum for Oregon and copies of the National Seed Strategy if anybody's interested in that. So just a few copies of that. All right, any more questions? Thank you, Melanie. Oh, wait, one more second. Oh, I just, there's a thing I was talking about a little more. I have children, one's a teenager, the one's four. Oh. And um, we're all looking for volunteer activities. Um, and a lot of stuff around the town. And we do a lot of events and restoration projects, mostly with arborists. Um, but it sounds like there's some Lots of kids in the care of the time. Oh, great. This sounds like um, she could contact them and talk about possibly training to teach teachers if anything around here is interested. In. We're always looking to volunteer. So. Great. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, and I hope the curriculum could provide plenty of activities for kids. And there's lots of opportunities for citizen science here. Yes, and yeah. this is one thing I'm hoping that the Native Plant Society can get more involved in in the coming years. Of There's so much, like just monarch monitoring. There's like four different apps or websites that Steve told me about where you can just go on the apps on your phone or go to your desktop, whatever, and just log in, you know, what you've seen. And you can get much more complicated and more detailed with a lot of these citizen science projects. Um, 
and that's where schools, it's perfect for, mm -hmm. for kids. Um, I, I want to talk to you a little more about okay. the, the school thing, yeah. It's, um, but I think we need to get more people in town involved in citizen science. And what about the Pueblo here for growing seeds? Have you made contact with Taos? No. no. Because they're really getting back into their farming. Yeah, they're doing a lot of agriculture out there. Lots of agriculture just in the last, since we've been here, in the last five, ten years. Yes. It's, um, I've given presentations at two, um, two meetings, uh, in a couple meetings, um, and I don't know if Taos was there, but yeah, that sounds like a good tip.